Um, so I guess what unites all of us is uh, we're all tackling waste plastic um, all in different ways. Um, and we're um, the second underlying theme is that we're all making items from plastic, whether that's imagery or um, working with volunteer programs or uh, making artwork and uh, craft items. Um, the problem with plastic is um, since the 1950s, essentially, uh, it's a revolutionary material. It shaped the modern world, um, but it's a bit of a victim of its own success. Um, it's made from oil, fossil fuels. Um, we refer to plastics, but there's actually lots of different types of plastics, and this is part of the problem. Uh, the pros of plastic are that it's light, it's durable, um, it's resistant to chemicals, oils, impact. It's very tough. Uh, it can be shaped in uh, lots of different ways. Uh, it can be made in lots of different colours and it's fairly inexpensive. We all use plastic every single day. Um, but the cons of plastic is that there's too much of it. Uh, it's resistant to chemicals, um, oils. It's very difficult to get rid of. And too much of it is finding its way into the ecosystem. Um, at that point, plastic becomes pollution, and this is a problem. It can take hundreds, if not thousands of years for plastic to break down. It doesn't decompose like organic matter, uh, like paper or wood or even metals. Um, it breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, it entangles marine life, um, and it can be ingested by marine life, and it's having a terrible impact all around the world. Uh, if you look closely around your own room that you're in now, how much plastic is around you, how much how much are you using? We, we, we all use it. Um, around the world, we produce 350 million tons of plastic every year. Um, of that at the moment, I think uh, around 55% is discarded, 25% is incinerated, 20% was recycled. That's from a study in 2015. I think in Europe, we recycle around 40% of plastic at the moment. Uh, but we need to be more careful about where our plastic ends up. Uh, reusing it as much as we can uh, and, and, uh, and recycling it and being a, a lot more careful about why it's ending up in the ecosystem. And I'm sure all of our guests today will will mention that um, and studies they've been involved in at, look at, at looking at this. Um, I work for Green Hive. Green Hive is an environmental um, and community wellbeing charity based in Nairn. Um, Green Hive's organized uh, litter picks, beach cleans, uh, they established a community orchard and they have been doing craft projects working with waste streams. Uh, the first of which was the Bumble Bags project, which has been really successful. And that's taking waste textiles and with a group of volunteers, turning waste textiles into bags. Uh, mostly, notably shopping bags originally, which they distributed around uh, retailers in the town of Nairn that people could use instead of plastic bags. Uh, the project I've been involved with in Green Hive is the Green Hive Workshop project. Uh, that started in August 2019. Uh, it was a group of volunteers uh, and myself took on an empty industrial unit and we set it up as a community access workshop. Uh, we had tools and equipment donated from local people and local businesses and we refurbished those um, into items that we could um, take waste plastic and we could transform it into new items. Uh, we have a, established a plastic drop-off zone <laughs> where people could drop off waste plastic that they've collected. Um, and our design philosophy is upcycling plastics. I mean, some plastics are used for minutes um, and we take those plastics and we try and, we're trying to transform in, them into items that people will keep for years. Um, so it's a, a kind of a form of upcycling. Um, <clears throat> we, I come from a background in sculpture and manufacturing. So for me, uh, I look at plastics as a material with loads of uh, potential to, to be used, um, but just use responsibly. 
Uh, so basically, we're trying to set up the workshop as a, a end user of waste plastic so that when waste plastics are collected, we can actually use that as a commodity. Um, and part of what we do as well, it, it's, a, it's a social hub. Uh, we do skills building. Um, um, the first items we made are some of the clocks that are on our website and we're looking at um, some new items. Obviously, COVID-19, the workshop project has been closed, but uh, from next week, we're actually looking at reopening with some changes. So we're hoping to get back there soon. Um, Green Hive's uh, volunteers focused organization um, and without our volunteers, our projects wouldn't run. Uh, I'm sure some of our volunteers will be watching. Uh, so hello to all of you. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you back at the workshop soon. Um, Green Hive uh, over the COVID-19 lockdown period was actually awarded the Queen's Award for volunteering. Um, so we're really proud of that. And um, again, that's a tribute to all the hard work of all our volunteers. Uh, we also, we've created a, a plastic education pack, which is a, an eight page booklet that goes into a bit more detail about our kind of philosophy of the project, about the processes we use, um, and about the work that Green Hive does in Nairn. Um, and that, you can get that from our website. It's, it's free to download from our website. So perhaps after the webinar, you could have a look at our webpage and, and download that. and. Um, and see what you think. I did some of the drawing in it as well. So I uh, hope you enjoy it. Um, I guess that's about it for me. I think I'm aware of time. I think I might pass over to Mandy Barker next. Very excited uh, when Mandy agreed to join us at the Highland Ocean Plastics webinar. She's a internationally renowned photographer um, and some of her amazing images um, are a call to action against waste plastic and she's exhibited all around the world so uh, if I could pass over to you Mandy if that's okay. Yes thank you very much Andy and uh, thank you everyone for listening in and thank you to Green High for inviting me to speak um, that's very kind of you. Uh, so yeah going back probably 10 years is when I first sort of um, began to see plastic washing up on the beach. I'm from England in the UK um, from East Yorkshire and there's an area called Spurn Point which is a kind of peninsula and as I kind of spent time there as a child collecting sort of natural objects like driftwood and shells and things like that like everybody does um, over the last sort of 20 years when I sort of returned to sort of visit parents I began to see sort of waste washing up on the shorelines especially plastic uh, and I began to wonder what I could do about it and kind of how I could let other people know what was going on on the coastline because obviously people that live in land as well maybe aren't aware of what's going on so this kind of um, culminated with a part-time photography course I was doing and I thought it would be really good to kind of collect this plastic or at least photograph the plastic on the shoreline to let people know what was going on and what sorts of things were washing up uh, and one particular day I went there was a children's car seat um, a fridge freezer part of a computer casing um, and I was it was my own kind of shock really at seeing these sorts of things and wondering where they were coming from um, that kind of empowered me to sort of create the work that I do. Um, initially I started photographing plastic as I found it on the shoreline um, trying to make it look interesting but also to show people what was there but I found people weren't really interested in seeing that um, because in England anyway there's quite a lot of waste you know at the side of the road and that sort of thing and I think people are kind of a bit anaesthetized to seeing waste and rubbish at the side of the road. Uh, so I realized that I had to do something different to try and engage the audience. So I began to collect the plastic and bring it home to my studio and photograph it on a black background. Um, and I hope you might see some of the images pop up as I'm speaking um, because it's quite hard to uh, explain if you don't see them. Um, so basically I started floating in individual objects and I created a kind of a timeline of different types of plastic and how long it took different pieces of plastic to degrade in the ocean. Uh, at that time, 10 years ago, um, you know, there was information about, you know, a plastic bag might take three years to decompose and things like that. But now as science has increased, um, we now know that all plastic ever produced, uh, unless it's been burnt, is still with us somewhere on the planet, which is, you know, particularly shocking sort of statistic. 
Um, when I sort of was looking more into the subject after photographing individual objects, I realised that there were these mass accumulations of plastic existing all around the world. Um, uh, I was just so shocked. I just I knew there and then when I was doing the research that it was a subject that I wouldn't be able to turn away from and that I wanted to continue to develop um, and represent and try and create further awareness. So I started getting larger collections um, from around the UK and from around the world and creating these images called soup, which is um, also a description given by scientists to the amount of plastics that are suspended in the ocean. Um, and also the play on the fact that, you know, a lot of marine creatures obviously digest and ingest, so I should say, um, pieces of plastic. So the play on soup and eating plastic um, was another connotation to the series. Um, I also wanted to try and include other people to collect objects. So I did a series called Penalty. Uh, this involved me sending out a call on social media that was shared with um, Greenpeace and CNN and lots of different organizations for people to collect footballs from their local beach and post them to me, um, for me to photograph and create a series of, um, you know, a global collection of footballs washed up on the beach. This was at the time of the World Cup and I wanted to kind of create awareness, you know, on the back of a kind of a social uh, sporting event. Um, and actually I did get a call from somebody in Scotland who, um, who found 20 balls. He emailed me and said he got 20 on his beach and I thought, wow, that's quite a lot. Uh, and then it kind of went on and he had like 70 and then it was like 120 and I was thinking, you know, what's going on? Um, he actually turned out to be a coastal ranger on the west coast of Scotland and in the end he sent me, uh, well he didn't send me, he collected and saved for me um, 228 footballs which uh, I had to drive up in a small van to Scotland and collect and bring back to my studio to create this um, collage of footballs. Um, so another um, relationship with Scotland is that I was asked by Greenpeace to join part of the uh, Beluga 2 um, expedition, which was around Scotland to examine the amount of plastic on the shores and islands uh, around there. Um, and I went from the lake to the island of Sande, um, which was where I was for a few days and I collected all the plastic on that particular island. Um, and the amount of waste there was really shocking, um, you know, alongside, you know, Greenpeace were also photographing and filming, um, you know, marine life and stunning birds and all different things there. But alongside them, I was kind of on the shoreline collecting all this plastic. Um, not to highlight any particular area, because obviously, you know, um, these sort of places aren't responsible for the amount of plastic that lands there. You know, in the Gulf Stream, this has come up from, you know, it could be anywhere from um, the US, from Newfoundland, pieces of plastic, you know, they kind of drift from all over the place. So um, not to sort of say that Sande is responsible in any way for the amount of plastic that washes up there. But this was a particular area that I was focusing on with the Greenpeace uh, expedition. Uh, I'd just like to mention another expedition that I went on last year, which was to Henderson Island, which is an isolated island right in the middle of the South Pacific. Um, and this was part of a team to clean up the island and also a team of scientists to research um, this particular beach, which is said to be the most plastic polluted beach in the world. Uh, in 2017, scientists did um, some studies there to um, you know, find out how much plastic there was per um, area of land on the beach. So this was the, um, this was the point of going to this particular island. And uh, just today, actually, I've, received, I've uh, released the new series of work that I produced as part of being on this expedition. So it was an incredible opportunity uh, to see firsthand, you know, um, the kind of horrible kind of beauty uh, of the, kind of, um, the, the, well, the, the ugliness of the plastic with the beauty of the marine reserve. Uh, and this is something I should point out about my work is that I collect plastic um, and with the aim to make it look beautiful, to make the images look beautiful, to attract the viewer to look at the work and then to read the caption and the title and realize why it's been created, where it's been collected from. Uh, and it's kind of to shock the viewer really. It's almost like, um, a contradiction between beauty and then this kind of stab in the back to 
shock people with um, you know the, the horror of what's going on around the world and how it's affecting different ecosystems and habitats um, of different environments around the world. Um, so yeah, so you can check my website out and look at my recent work. Um, and yeah, if there's any more that you want me to say about that, I'm not sure of the time because I'm uh, keeping uh, going on, but I haven't kept a, a time on that. I don't know if you want me to keep you're going. You're okay, Mandy. You, you're okay for another few minutes, actually. All right. Okay. Right. <clears throat> um, so yes, uh, I did an, also did an expedition in 2012. Uh, I was very lucky to be awarded an environmental bursary by the Royal Photographic Society. And this enabled me to go across from Turkey to Hawaii, across the North Pacific Ocean, uh, and the garbage patch, as it's known. Um, this is kind of a bit of a misconception because people often think that this is a solid floating island of plastic, when actually it isn't. It's um, a very densely polluted uh, area in the ocean, but all the plastic is suspended at different levels. Um, <clears throat> and I actually produced a series of work called Shoal, from that um, particular expedition. And this is based on collections that were taken from the surface of the water by using a trawl, a manta trawl, which is like a kind of a long sieve-like net where you scoop the surface of the ocean and uh, microplastics and small pieces of plastics are taken out. And um, you know the scientists on board the trip were doing research into those pieces of plastic. Uh, the trip was for a month and I recorded every single piece of plastic that was brought on board the uh, yacht that um, was the vessel that we were using uh, in that particular expedition. Um, another project I've done is called Hong Kong Soup. Uh, this involved me, <coughs> excuse me, going to Hong Kong and collecting plastic from over 30 different beaches in Hong Kong. And I created images um, using toys and all different types of things to try and generate um, an interest from the people in Hong Kong and try and culturally engage them with the different aspects of objects and things that I was using to try and make them think about their waste and how much goes into landfill in Hong Kong per day, especially polystyrene, um, which was a particular issue at that time. So again, you can look at my work um, based on Hong Kong and you know, kind of see um, the different types of things that were washed up there and how I created these images to try and um, engage people in Hong Kong. Um, <clears throat> is, that, is that okay? Or do you want me to carry on? <laughs> uh, that's great, Mandy. Thanks very much. And, uh, yeah, I recommend everybody have a look at uh, Mandy's website and um, you'll see some of the amazing images she's made there. Thank you. Uh, Next up, we have um, Joan Darcy and Julian um, Moreau from Plastic at Bay in Durness. Uh, Plastic at Bay is an amazing project up in Durness that combines uh, research of the impact of the plastic, direct action on cleaning up um, the beach where they are, craft making. Um, and research in the remoulding and remaking of uh, plastic pollution. Um, could I pass over to you, Julian and John? Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Julian, and um, um, I'm going to start by uh, showing you a little bit what we do because um, I think it's it's not necessarily uh, obvious. Let me try to share my screen. Here we go. Share should work. Here we go. Um, so basically, um, <clears throat> historically, we were just uh, people which uh, um, cleaned our local beach, and uh, we saw um, that there were incredible amounts of uh, plastic coming in, um, and um, we just decided that uh, we needed to do something a bit different to um, to manage to actually really clean what what was there. So we've created this company, it's called uh, Plastic at Bay, and it's, uh, it's, it's basically an experiment of circular economy where um, we try to generate money to uh, remove pollution from the area. And, um, and then, um, yeah, it's just like the, with this pollution, we create objects that uh, generate revenue to clean more. That's basically the concept on the paper. So, um, let me next, uh, yeah. 
So um, why bother? I guess everybody here is aware that uh, there, is, there is at least 40 years of uh, very intense plastic pollution in the ocean and uh, the coast of Scotland is, uh, is not spared. Um, the, in my opinion, the most dangerous part of uh, plastics is the, it's, um, it's that it really likes uh, um, endocrine uh, disruptive uh, molecules and that it's, uh, it helps these molecule penetrate the food chain and us in the end. Also, the, the other problem of uh, plastic is that it's, uh, it's pervasive and uh, it's, uh, it's one of the only pollution which attacks uh, the full uh, trophic chain from uh, corals to whales. And that's probably um, why it's so dangerous compared to other <clears throat> uh, pollution problems we have. So, <clears throat> Uh, when um, when we started uh, working on it, um, I'm um, a geoscientist uh, as a background. Uh, I've, I've done a bit of field work, so I went into different places and I tried to understand why some places were extremely polluted and others um, uh, much less. So that's basically um, um, the, um, the northwest of Scotland. And you can see in red, these are areas of extreme pollutions. So we, we're speaking uh, like several tons, maybe up to 10 tons a year coming. So there are different oceanographic uh, reasons for that, but we are still working on it and I will come back um, with more recent results. So <clears throat> um, I was advised very quickly um, to acquire data and um, that's, that's uh, um, we do things a little bit differently, so that because we go very regularly uh, on a specific uh, spot which is quite polluted, and we measure what we remove, just in weight, because in terms of uh, of um, uh, recognizing items, it's fairly um, uh, constant. But uh, um, I've been uh, producing these uh, pollution reports for uh, three years. And basically what you see uh, with the bars, it's the cumulative weight since the start so the first time we cleaned there was 500 kilos on the beach and then you see it increases like that so you can see there are steps like these and during uh, two winters there is uh, one in 2017 and one in uh, 2008 uh, and uh, what you see this curve is actually the rate of pollution in weight which rise on the beach so there is a point uh, every week more or less when we can especially in, in winter where a lot arrives. And so these peaks most of the time that you see are increases in plastic pollution. So the baseline, which looks relatively low because you probably can't read this, but this is about three kilos every day. So three kilos a day, 360 days, about a ton each year on a single beach, in a single, in a specific spot. And uh, then you have these peaks and this is the most impressive one, which is associated with uh, Storm Caroline in December 2017. And this storm in three days brought about one ton of plastic. Um, that's basically, that means that um, a full year of pollution arrived in three days. So, of course, uh, as a scientist, when I started seeing things like this, I was like, well, we need to be able to know um, why these things happen? Was the was the mechanics uh, behind these things? Because they are catastrophic for uh, any any place. And uh, we thought that we had clean, and then it was better in 2018 and 19. And then this winter uh, we started uh, seeing the the plastic pollution climbing. From September, we had 30 percent increase from the baseline, and then it go it ramped up. Um, in December and January with the biggest storms uh, with relatively high uh, pollution rates up to uh, 50 kilos a day almost. So we are trying to understand this um, beside other things. Uh, I will come back on this uh, later on again. So uh, what what we can do um, about these waves of plastic is, is um, well, I think first is to actually study it. Uh, we have to we have to be able to, um, to forecast how much plastic is gonna be on each point on our coastline very quickly. So we can uh, distribute the resources necessary to protect this coastline. 
um, because the plastic is not going to disappear from the ocean uh, magically. It's there. So um, I've done some uh, simple uh, models. And uh, four colors are four different uh, beaches. And this is the amount of plastic I estimate uh, from today. Oh, well, actually, this was made from 2015 to 2050 uh, to see how much plastic there would be uh, on, on several local beaches here. So on the left, that's uh, if we don't do anything, uh, the local beaches by 2050 would have about more than 250 tons. Well, actually, they would have by 2035, so in 15 years, they would have more than 250 tons on each, each beach. Um, that's a, a scenario where we only use um, a community work, so uh, like a three or four beach cleans a year. And <clears throat> you can see that it's a bit less steep, but it's uh, still by, by 2040, we, we have uh, like uh, hundreds of uh, tons of plastic on, on these beaches. Um, and this is a simulation with, uh, with actually, uh, this is what we do. We hire a ranger all year round, uh, not at the moment because of the virus, but uh, um, <clears throat> this person actually professionally cleaned these, uh, these areas. And then you can kind of uh, keep um, the problem a little bit controlled. And um, by 2050, we, we are still uh, around 50 tons. Well, so that's, that's including the sediment. Uh, uh, so not just the surface, it's the whole beach itself, the whole environment. So, <clears throat> of course, uh, we, we need to, to think about this, uh, these things. So we, we've hired these rangers and um, like a, a ranger in winter uh, removes about two tons of plastic, which is, which is massive. I mean, two tons, if it's in the same place, it's, it's maybe nothing. But uh, when you collect it in pieces of a few grams, it's an enormous work. And it's essential uh, to protect uh, the area. They're also very good to speak with uh, with the public because they are outdoors where with the other users and they can show what they are doing and what's going on because uh, most people don't actually see uh, the quantity of plastic on the coastline. Um, of course, uh, for, for us, it's a, we are in a remote area and creating jobs is, is always good. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, we probably need about 10 to, to cover an area of a radius of about 50 miles in, in this area, which is quite polluted. So we, of course, we try to um, to have um, to have the community together, and we organize talks like uh, like uh, we are doing now. And you can see uh, here on the picture the, there is the team of uh, Green Hive, which uh, came for uh, a little recycling uh, workshop. And of course, uh, beach cleans. So you can see a, a van full of uh, of rubbish, and that's more like local kind of um, beach cleans where we have time to make tea and so on. It's, <laughs> it's uh, it's also part of uh, of the um, the work. So we do recycle plastic. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really go into the details of uh, what we we do. I mean, they are relatively uh, 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 you know without melting like these kind of doormats. But we we also uh, uh, have developed developed several met methods to actually use ocean plastic, uh, and we are trying uh, principally to produce uh, construction material. We do also a lot of things which we can sell to uh, visitors, uh, but the objective is to be able to produce something um, where we can use a lot of volume of plastic because we collect about nine to 10 tons of plastics and uh, we need to be able to reuse it. And um, yeah, so that's uh, my final, but I'm gonna switch I'm going to switch quickly because I think I still have a bit of time. Uh, I'm going to switch to uh, something uh, which might interest you. So we try uh, to develop uh, internet uh, tools. So I hope you will see it properly. Here you go. So um, this is uh, our, our web page. And uh, we recently made a, a portal. So uh, let's, uh, like, si simply speaking, when we, since we started recording the data and how much we collect, we actually got some momentum. We could show that the area had a serious problem and that we needed, I mean, that we needed finances to actually cope with it. And yeah, it's just a general awareness. 
So I've been producing these pollution reports uh, for own company, but uh, I was thinking maybe other groups which have no, not necessarily the, the computing skills uh, would like to, to do the same thing. So I've made a, a web portal where you, you can actually register your own data and display them online. Um, so that's, that's basically, it's a simple web page like this and you can click here to submit your data. We'll show you, um, uh, you have a, a map here in the UK. So at the moment I have three groups and it's, it's us here. So I should work. Uh, so that's us in the, in Northwest uh, Scotland. And you can see the areas which are more affected than others. And then there is um, a group which is uh, quite uh, impressive, which is the Caithness Beachlands. And you can see uh, um, how much they, they collect. It's about uh, 15 tons in the last uh, three years, which is quite, quite a lot for volunteers. They are there every day. Um, extra, extra. So you, you can uh, register as a team or as a group or, or as an individual. And then you can generate a pollution report. And here is the same pollution report as the one I show you. So that's the peak of uh, Storm Caroline on Banlakil Bay. And that's the peak, the peak of this uh, winter. And uh, you can, uh, so there are a few uh, places you can, um, you can have a look in, uh, in Dunnet, for example, which is quite badly affected. And well, it's clean regularly. And you can, you can see also the evolution of the pollution uh, on these areas. And so what we do with it, it's uh, this kind of uh, simulation. So we use, uh, we make uh, numerical models <clears throat> to, uh, to try to, to understand uh, the distribution of plastic in the area. Uh, this is the density of plastic um, in, our, in our area, calibrated uh, with the, the volumes of plastic we find. And you see this huge patch which is forming in front of Cape Raff. So it's a clustering. So um, the tidal and the wind uh, regime in this scenario has focused the plastic just uh, offshore or, or area, and this is why it's so polluted. So, uh, and this is just a single scenario. Uh, yeah, and then to submit, you, <coughs> if it works, here you go. It's very simple. Uh, you put your name, your email address, uh, the date where you collected it, the beach where you collected it. So before you have to contact me to register your beach and then you put the weight. And if you have something to, to say, but well, you just put the feedback and that's it. It takes, uh, it works on a phone or anything and it takes uh, 15 seconds. Um, all right. That's it. Uh, that's it for me. Thanks very much, Gillian. It's a uh, great work you're both doing up there. And um, uh, we'll move on to our next guest uh, is uh, a Scottish artist, uh, uh, very experienced at working with coastal communities and recovering marine plastic pollution and turning it into sculptural installations that force people to confront the scale of plastic waste in the landscape of Scotland. Um, pass over to you Julia if that's okay. Okay um, well thanks to Green Hive for inviting me into this discussion. Um, I'm based on the northwest coast of Scotland and like everyone here I think there would be a moment that you can remember that you got involved and certainly I am totally and utterly entangled with plastic a bit like Mandy was saying. Um, I walked onto a beach not far from here um, in 2012 and I was there to study seaweed and to learn seaweed identification so I wanted to go down and really look into the rock pools and down on the strand line and I walked onto the beach and I couldn't see anything other than plastic and I couldn't see the rocks, I couldn't see the seaweed, couldn't see the life in the rock pools and it was one of those moments that I knew somehow it's going to change my practice and up until then, I'd been using lots of plants and structures and growing things. So I collected together as much as I could, took it back to the studio, and it sat with me for 10 months stinking in the back of the studio. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I knew that somehow I had to do something with it. And 
um, as an artist whose practice is has got an educational element, I knew that there was there's a great potential of art to show things in different ways to to put it out there. Um, and so I did a lot of research and development, got some finance and set up a series of small residences. And straight away, I wanted people to, to come along with me and witness what I was seeing on the beaches. Um, we get so familiar with seeing things and then we get to a certain level and we don't see it anymore. I'm sure we're all aware of that. Um, so created a series of kind of workshops kind of come along with me have a look and set up a studio so that people could come and join me and look under microscopes and examine beach samples um, and from there kind of developed a series of workshops knowing at that point so that's about 2013 that when I went and started to talk to people the things they didn't know at that point was how long things lasted, how long that plastic lasts out there. Um, so I kind of focused on that and a bit like you, Andy, came up and um, as a kind of educational aid, I produced a guide to beach litter, um, which kind of in a very basic way shows how to identify what you are actually seeing on the beach but also how it came to be there and actions you can take to get involved. Um, as an installation artist, um, I began to use, um, I began to create a series of work that was again along timelines, so how long things would last before they broke down and putting them in odd places like museums and galleries on the beach. So every time I did a beach walk, we would then make a timeline um, just to get people involved with that. Um, and I, I, when I knew I was coming on to this discussion, I was beginning to think of all the installations that I've made and activities I've done, which was the most effective at getting people involved. And certainly the ones where you ask people to join you to collect, certainly the kind of straight away the beach cleans, I worked with the Marine Conservation Society and learned their method of recording and how important that is and kind of connecting to Julian's work and Joan's work. Um, that repeat um, recording and the importance of data because you don't know what's happening out there unless you've got what you can see one year to the next. And the year that um, the, uh, the extra cost on plastic bags came in, so the year before we collected on Ullapool Beach, I think we collected 26 kind of carrier bags. And the next year and the following year, it decreased. And it's amazing to, I suppose, the power of statistics and the power of recording repeatedly shows you that you can make an impression. Um, you can make a great effect. And that kind of getting everybody to join in with you is fantastic. So I've made installations um, in Shetland and here and collected um, lots of different types of plastic. Um, I tend to, unlike Mandy, who kind of uses the kind of the familiar, I try to find things that are slightly less familiar. And in when I was doing a survey on a beach um, on one of the summer isles near here, I started to collect what has now been recognized by geologists uh, and identified as um, plastic glomerate. And it's, um, it's when people burn plastic litter on a beach and it bonds with the rocks or the shells. And so I made a massive installation using this. So it was a way I made an art plastic archipelago, but it didn't look like the objects, the plastic objects that we usually see on the beach. But by using something that was less familiar it was people were drawn to it. So it was a way of um, engaging people in that discussion, which is a really interesting one. The horrendous thing about um, obviously burning plastic on beaches, and it happens just about on every beach I've ever been to, is that it's dangerous to yourselves, it's carcinogenic, and it's also, it kind of smothers the kind of the micro environments that creatures live in. So it bonds with the rocks. 
so that was fascinating but masses I can't tell you the whole of the back of the studio is absolutely full of it and I do big installations with it um so yeah so I've then gone on to um work in a much more uh, kind of sculptural way Andy a bit like you <laughs> going back to sculpture rather than installations and I just the project that I'm working on at the minute is called litter cubes and the idea was that I would collect seven or eight different types of plastic, the most familiar that we find. So from um, plastic bottles that I've got, I can show you around, anyway, plastic bottle cubes. Um, so we've been engaging people to go out and collect them um, in five different locations around Scotland. The idea being that we can show the mass. So this is a very small one. This is, I'm sure you'll all recognize those. Um, the cotton bud sticks, that were made of plastic, which is now kind of being kind of legislated against. Um, again, it's a good story because now we're going back to using cardboard. So it shows you that public pressure through different organizations and individuals can make a difference. So they're going back to cardboard. So that's a really good story. But I've been collecting these for years along with different organizations and each one of these cubes is about 500. And when I started to display these the first time in Shetland, it was like I asked the children to draw them and they drew them and they, but they told the story of how it got there. And that's what it's all about. How did this get into the ocean? How do we stop it getting into the ocean? So you can pose these amazing questions. So through artworks that are kind of even small and tiny, you can actually get somewhere. So, you know, it's fantastic. So. Over the last year, I've been making and weaving different materials, a bit like Julian knows this well. <laughs> so this is, um, it's a litter cube that is um, being woven together using box strapping, which goes around fish boxes and washes up in massive bundles and then individual strands all over the place. And we collect masses of it. And, um, this one was actually made in Shetland, and even though it's quite big, it only this one actually only weighs about four ki four kilos. But the thing about the litter cubes is, I'm trying to show the connection to the amount of energy that is lying around on our beaches. One of the things that I've quickly realised is that when I get talking to people and I say, "Well, where does plastic come from? What's it made from?" people say paper they say anything other than what we know is that it's made from kind of finite resources oil gas and out of 107 people only six people could tell me that it was oil at the dynamic earth in edinburgh last year and i it just blew my mind so i thought i'm going to make this connection so with these cubes i've been asking people to help me make them in public places and then we've weighed them so that we can calculate the amount of energy and I've been working with a scientist who is able to use the formula to show us how much energy is in it so all these the cubes that are sitting around me I've got lots of them um I now have the energy value and so I'm hoping to make a film to actually show the amount of oil in all the sculptures and to show it and make that connection next year in the run up to COP26, the climate conference, what is wasted on our beaches, obviously sitting there is finite resources and it's adding to the climate emergency. So to make that link that I feel having <laughs> worked and been entangled with plastic for eight years is just kind of being left out. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want me to say anything else. Or where, I don't know what the time is. No, that's great, Julia. It's brilliant work you're doing, it really is. And really looking forward to seeing the, um, your work at uh, COP26. Um, um, I hope everybody who's watching, um, you'll notice the connection between all the projects as well, is that we can't solve this problem on our own. It, you know, it involves other people getting involved with each of the projects, each of the artists. So I hope um, after the webinar, you'll go and have a look. We'll, we'll share the links to all our all our guests' um, own web pages. So 
whether you can get involved with their projects directly, get involved with Green Hive or Plastic at Bay, or um, you know, funding is always a problem for all of our projects as well. So even if you're you you, you can't visit any of us, um, if you'd consider helping us with funding or um, that would be really helpful. And uh, I'd like to move on to our next guest speaker, who is not based in Scotland. Um, but I think it's important that when we talk about Scotland, um, Jen Jones, a marine biologist who works in the Galapagos, uh, which is obviously a long way from Scotland. Um, yeah, it's the inspiration for Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species. Um, in Darwin's time, plastic wasn't having an effect on the evolution of our natural world. Um, but I think the situation there now might be a bit different. Um, can I pass over to you, Jen? Hey, afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, Andy and Greenhive team for inviting me to be part of this. Um, I'm really inspired to hear about all the projects that are happening here. So, well, by the way, I am in Exeter in England right now. I'm not in Galapagos, in case you're wondering why the connection is so good. Um, but what really strikes me is how many similarities and parallels there are with the programs that we're working on out in Galapagos. And as well as reminding us all that this is a global problem, um, as Neil said at the beginning, I feel like we all have a part to play in making global solutions to this as well. And there's so much we can learn from each other of the different approaches we're taking, both scientifically and in public engagement through art and um, other communications. So, uh, right, I'm going to try and share my screen, see if it's going to work. Okay, let's see if we can go full screen. And start at the beginning that helps okay um so i've been working with the galapagos conservation trust um gct since 2011 um we're the only uk ngo that's focused just on the galapagos islands um i'm also working with the university of exeter doing a phd on the um impacts of microplastics in the marine food web in galapagos as well um, so I'm very fortunate to work for one of our best conserved places in the planet. Um, very famous for their unique biodiversity, as Andy mentioned, we have that amazing heritage link with Darwin. Um, this place has been so important for informing our place in the world, um, in the natural world through evolution. It's also going to be playing a huge part in um, the future as well. Um, the ecosystems in Galapagos are very sensitive and we um, predict that they will be a kind of um, canary, if you like, for how a lot of other ecosystems are gonna cope with climate change, et cetera, in the future. Oh, let me just get rid of some peeps, there we go. Um, so why do we have this amazing biodiversity here? The islands are a thousand kilometers off the coast of continental South America. They belong to Ecuador, um, situated on the equator. So very, very remote. Um, the currents and the oceanography is remarkable around this place. We can see here some of the, the main ones that have an influence. They all bring different temperature. They bring different nutrient profiles and they also bring different floating materials that of course we now um, no, it includes plastic. Um, the most important one for us in our study is this Peruvian current, also known as the Humboldt current that starts in Antarctica and flows all up that um, coast of South America before veering out towards the islands. Global studies suggested before um, we started this program that plastic would be really low in Galapagos. So you can see here on this map, the whiter areas are the lower plastic areas. This is mostly because we know that generally floating material gets concentrated in the middle of these oceanic gyres. We've heard of the Great Pacific um, garbage patch that's up here. So originally we're assuming that most of the plastic that is leaking into the environment from the Americas is, and also in Asia, is ending up in these gyres. But as Julian's work shows, you need good um, field data and monitoring data to make the models 
better to work. And you can see on this map down here how many data gaps we have around the world. So some areas are very well studied, some not so much at all. So you can see the Eastern Pacific here is uh, really data poor. So there's a need for more information. We can see in the islands that um, it clearly isn't the case that there's low plastic. We're getting huge accumulations pretty much to the extent of Henderson Island in some places, which is um, very shocking. Um, these sites are about a kilometre away on the same island, and this really shows that difference between the windward side of the coast and the uh, sheltered side, which you saw in the Scottish data as well. Um, so how on earth do you go around about uh, putting together a programme to start studying this? Um, we have been scoping this out uh, for, well, since about 2015, and then we launched the program in 2018 with a series of workshops with a bunch of amazing stakeholders. So we have um, government representatives, local authorities, many NGOs, universities from all around the world. Um, we have community groups, school groups, businesses. So the tourism industry is really important for us to engage in these solutions. Um, and what we've done is mapped out a program that will take us to this vision that the National Park has of a plastic free Galapagos. So right now we are um, doing pilot work and of course trying to secure the funds to be able to achieve this. But um, we think it's really important to look at the problem as a multidisciplinary, uh, well, sorry, the solutions as, as needed in a multidisciplinary approach across these three themes. So we need to understand the physical system. We need to know how much is where, where is it coming from? How long is it staying there? Um, we need to know what species are most at risk. And we want to know what behaviors we can promote to drive the changes to reduce plastic inputs into the environment. Um, so unfortunately, this is a PDF, so the video won't work, but we also have models that um, show that the majority of litter that's coming from the continent to Galapagos is from Peru and Ecuador. So this is really good news for us from an intervention perspective that we can focus on this as a key source. Now we're also aware that this is not the only source of plastics. Um, a significant con contingent comes from fisheries, so we need to consider how we're going to engage that industry, how we can improve waste management processes for international fisheries, as well as what's happening on the islands. So we have been collecting field data. Um, we haven't been weighing it um, as much as counting and categorizing the items. So a bit like Julia said as well, we're trying to work out where they're coming from. Um, so we're looking out for particular brands. We're working with an archaeologist actually to uh, work on ways we can see how long plastic has been in the environment, where it might have come from, what it meant to the person who used it, where it might have leaked into the system. Again, that storytelling part is really important, I think, here. Um, the other cool thing which we've managed to set up is working with local school students and university students to do these surveys, so a bit like the volunteer model as well. Um, the problem we have is that many of the beaches where we get the big accumulations are not accessible. So um, leveraging big citizen science projects for cleanup is a challenge. Um, for us, the citizen science contingent will be more about helping us to analyze this data. So from drone imagery or these photos from beach, we can get people involved online to help us to um, yeah, solve some of these questions we have about where this litter is coming from. So I mentioned the drones already. We're looking at new tech to try and make cleanup more cost effective and to work out where the most at risk places are in the archipelago. We're also studying microplastic in the in the sea surface, in the seabed. We're looking in, um, in the sea life as well. So in marine invertebrates that are important food sources for endangered species like Galapagos sea lions, the penguins, etc. Uh, also for the human food chain. Um, and then we're looking at street litter as well to look at how we can help uh, local municipalities to improve um, waste management on the islands. For the biological side, um, we're hoping to set up a kind of um, citizen science mechanism for recording interactions with animals and plastics. Um, in the meantime, however, we've been working on this threat scoring matrix so that we can um, map 
All of the evidence we've seen around the world of how plastic affects different species to the Galapagos marine food web, so we can start focusing our conservation on these most at risk species, which of course are facing a multitude of other threats as well, not just plastics. Um, yeah, we are seeing impacts everywhere. I mean, unfortunately, we're getting quite familiar around the world with these wildlife um, um, encounter images. Um, a colleague of mine, Juan Pablo Munoz, is based in Galapagos doing his PhD around the impacts to vertebrates um, at the same time. So we're working together, which is a really nice international collaboration. Um, and then we've also been doing a lot of work with people um, so there's great political support, which is very helpful. Um, the Minister of Galapagos is a huge advocate of the programme. They've um, introduced some single use plastic bans over the last year. And so we have this um, a keenness for that uh, legislation to back up what the science is suggesting. And so this puts us in a really positive um, place to be able to develop a model here that could work for other places. So we can um, distill monitoring protocols that could work in other places that are remote, um, suggestions for legislation, uh, and then of course public engagement as well. So one of my friends has just started a Precious Plastic Galapagos project that I know you guys work on in Scotland as well, so it'll be really interesting maybe to connect those groups and see if they can share ideas. Really inspired by the community um, grassroots approaches over there. So again, I think they would be really happy and uh, would love to share what they've been up to more directly with you guys as well. Um, and then just to finish, I find this this little uh, bottle cap doll really inspiring. So this was designed by one of our youth club members who um, wanted to design a mascot that could be given to all the taxi drivers to hang up in their taxis on the islands to remind people to use their reusable bags. So she designed loads of posters around these cap stalls, um, taught loads of younger children how to make them and then they yeah, made them available to all the taxis. So I think this kind of creative innovation that we're seeing to tackle this problem really should be celebrated and um, to keep us all feeling positive that we can find solutions to this problem. Sure, it's a huge one, but um, yeah, I think like stories like this make you feel that it, it is possible to, to turn this around. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Uh, that's great, Jen. Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, I think that's a great point you're making. I mean, uh, I saw, I've been looking through some of the questions coming in as well. And a lot of people are asking, you know, what, what, what can we do? And I think one of the first things we can do is just if everybody uses a little bit of less plastic every day, I mean, straight away, that's going to make a difference. And then just be careful about what we do with the plastic that's no longer useful to us. You know, have a think about where it's going. Um, but I think it'll really take producers, manufacturers, designers, retailers, consumers all coming together on this issue and um, and um, and tackling it that way. Um, I might uh, thanks all of our guest speakers. That was that was amazing. Um, I might pass um, over to Neil again if that's okay. And I think we've got quite a few questions coming in um, on the the live chat. Yeah, thanks very much, Andy. Wow, what what a combination of uh, presentations and 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 talks. Uh, I'm just conscious that uh, Joan, as well as uh, has not had an opportunity to speak just yet, and uh, Joan from Plastics at Bay is uh, is with us, but is um, has been struggling a little bit on the technology front today. Are you, are you there, Joan? You're on mute at the moment. Hi, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Uh, I just had a problem with my laptop, but I'm, I'm on my phone, so that's fine. So, um, yeah, Did so I'm all... Did you share anything just quickly? Um, no, I think Julianne has covered it all, so um, I'll try and join in with the discussion or help answer any questions that, that anybody has. Thanks. Cool. Okay, great. Well, I think the let's we've got uh, about another ten minutes. So um, it is fantastic that we've been joined by so many people. There's about two hundred participants and attendees on on today's webinar, which we're you know hugely encouraged by. And and a number of comments uh, have been coming in in the chat box around uh, how can we support 
the, the panelists, how can we share the work? Will we be able to get web links? Yes, we will we'll be sharing all the information uh, with you afterwards so that you can support uh, Mandy and Julia's work, for example, and all the other all the other um, panelists that you've seen presenting, and we'll we'll get all those web links out to you. Um, there's a number of questions that I think have already been answered on the sort of uh, the particular types of plastics that are common um, related to fishing and aquaculture and those sorts of things. Um, Andy, did you just want to say quickly about the type of plastic that we use in the workshop, just to cover off one of those practical questions? Yeah, I mean. Uh, the way we work with plastic in the workshop is that we, we, you know, plastic at room temperature is a solid, but when you heat it to the correct temperature for the type of plastic, um, then you can form it into into uh, new new shapes. Uh, the trouble is, when plastic's in the ocean and it gets all mixed together in different pieces, if you start melting that you know some of the plastic will be at the wrong temperature you don't want to be burning plastic that's when you know it can be harmful so uh, we tend in our booklet um the the education pack it goes in in a bit more detail in the different plastics we can use some are more difficult to work with than others um uh and i'm sure julian and joan could chat a bit about that as well um they they get a lot of um uh fishing related plastics up there is that right julian and john okay john are you speaking or i speak <laughs> i don't know just, um, i just got a toddler beside me who's just going to be crazy um yeah so yeah so we had um with us one of the reasons we started recycling was basically because um what we were collecting was indeed made of plastic and most of the fishing ropes are made out of polypropylene um, and this can't, you know, we can't put it into your normal recycling bin. So that was our uh, objective to start uh, the workshop. So, but then when we noticed, um, so it really took us time then because we had to really try to uh, like identify the different ropes and identify the different types of plastic. And that was really, really important, especially when you're recycling because um, they have different melting temperatures and um, they're different, they can give off fumes, you know, if you melt two different types of plastic together. So, um, so, so yeah, so th this is, this is very, very important. Um, and it's, a, it's been a very difficult part of us kind of setting up just to, to really try and identify this. And it's important as well, because then if we want to sell a product, we want to make sure that it's completely one type of plastic. So then people can recycle it again. And we know, you know, we've stamps that we can put on each product so they know it's like poly I basically at the moment we work with polypropylene ropes and HDPE which we get mostly from uh, fish crates that come up so and we're pretty sure that that's the type of plastic they are and um, we have different ways of testing it inside the lab which is by um, mostly by density tests which works pretty well so um, if anybody wants to know about that uh, how you can do test uh, what type of plastic it is at home uh, they can send us a message and we can explain that to them. I won't go into details now. Okay. Yeah, lovely. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, very helpful. And um, I guess there's been a, a number of questions and comments all, all that I'll try and summarise into a central theme and then maybe we can each have a, a brief opportunity to try and answer that question. And, and really it's about stopping, stopping the plastic at the source. Um, so instead of dealing with the output and the outcome of plastic pollution, dealing with the inputs into the system, and a number of panellists have touched on this, and, a, and, a, and it's been a theme around the questions and the comments, um, which is how do you stop it at source? How do you work with manufacturers of plastic? How do you work with the plastic polluters and, and the plastic that's coming into the system from uh, industries like fishing and agriculture? How do we work with governments and companies um, around pricing of of uh, eco alternatives, um, tax regulation, uh, whether it's public pressure or the COP26 that's coming up. Um, how, do we, how do we tackle um, that stopping of the plastic at source or at least reducing it in some fashion? And Julian, I, I was really struck by the work that you've been doing on sort of mapping the coastline and all the data and uh, your graph that showed us if we could do that, then it has the opportunity to dramatically improve the beaches. But maybe if we start start with yourself, Julian, what, what's your thought on stopping the plastics at the source? Uh, I, I will have a, a very unpopular opinion. 
um, okay, no, but it's it's obvious that we have to use uh, the minimum possible plastic uh, and like like reduce your consumption in a in an incredible kind of way. If you if you really know what are the the, the actual production rates of plastic, it's uh, we're going completely the other way around. We're doubling the production of plastic in the next years. So, um, and all that to make single use plastic is the strategy of uh, the plastic industry is to, to of course sell a lot of plastic. So they, they are promoting, they are doing everything they can to uh, sell a lot of single use. And that's the reality. Um, but um, what people, I don't know, but maybe you're aware, but what we collect is all plastic. We, we collect things which which are very old, maybe sometimes 40 years old, 30 years old. So, uh, so, so the plastic doesn't go away. And um, if, if we think into uh, uh, just the future or what we could do, we actually uh, don't focus on what, what is going on. And uh, we need to remove the plastic. We need to remove this hundreds of, no, I don't know, hundreds of millions of tons. I don't know where, where we are today with well, 50 million tons we are in the ocean at the moment or something like this. And um, I know uh, there is mm. a lot of microplastics. I know there, there is a lot of nanoparticles, but we can collect a lot of, of large objects. It's possible before they, they fragment. And it's it's a top priority. Uh, I, this is my opinion. This is a top priority. It's uh, it's easy to do. Community can do it. Governments can fund it. It's uh, it costs money, but it's 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 the emergency and the technology to actually, um, as Jane was showing, you know, using drones. And I know in Scotland we had the scrap boot project with the planes. Uh, I've collaborated with uh, marine biologists which use helicopters. Um, we need to know where is the where is the where is where is the pollution and and we need to be able to remove it and Thank i think you, are, that's my uh, my take on it but um <laughs> thank you thank you and and quickly to jen and maybe then to julia as well for uh, any any further thoughts on that question yeah um i totally agree with julian that um cleanup needs to happen especially in sensitive places because ultimately by removing that from the environment you're reducing future fragmentation into the microplastics etc um, I think cleanup and strategic cleanup is really important to make it cost effective but we can't keep scaling up cleanup and people don't want to pay for that and so I think for me it is about individual choices it's about engaging the industry somehow to design products that are not meant to be such quick use and last so long in the environment. So I think it's a lot about product design and thinking about the end of life of something that's produced as opposed to just what what is going to happen to it whilst it's being used. And then um, the final thing is accountability, because I think that's the problem that we have all said as well is um, unless we see it as a global problem that we're all contributing to and have to do something about, it's somebody else's. Like this plastic is washing up here, it's not ours. Why should we have to pay to clean it up? Why should we have to do this? So I feel like it's kind of that uh, global sense of accountability is very important to cultivate. Lovely, thank you, Jen. Yeah, and we'll come to Julia and then to Mandy and then we'll have to start wrapping up, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, certainly we have to keep picking it up, but it is to, it is related, to, obviously, to individual choices. And if we can get awareness out there that everything we, you know, if we can absolutely reduce dramatically what we're all using, then it will obviously have a knock-on effect. But from my point of view, I, I think lobbying is has a huge impact. Like, we would never have been kind of gone back to paper cotton bud sticks if there hadn't been a mass kind of protest and pressure put on the governments and the same with plastic bags. And for me, kind of lobbying the environmental, um, kind of the environment offices and all the kind of politicians connected to it is so important. Our 
kind of legislation in Scotland, really the environment so needs to go up a level and it needs to be enforced. You know, what Julian and I see on the northwest coast of the Highlands is massive, you know, like they huge, huge, kind of massive weight, kind of a huge fishing litter. I mean, all the records that we have, all the records that we have, you know, and the marine conservation puts it as like 11%. We have so much more, 90% of the litter that I pick up on beaches near here is fishing, you know, commercial fishing litter. And it is huge. Uh, mm. I just, yeah, it, there's got to be better legislation and it's got to be enforced. We can't keep, I certainly can't keep it up. And, you know, the mass yeah. of it has to be seen and the responsibility has to be acknowledged and there has to be legislation for sure. Thank you so much, Julia. You put it so beautifully. And, and and let's come to Mandy briefly. I'm just conscious of time as well. So, Mandy, your final thoughts on this uh, issue? Yes, I mean this. Uh, this has just it just made me aware that everyone here is cleaning up in some way or another. Um, mm. And I wouldn't want to be doing what I'm doing. Um, I mean, I'm doing it to raise awareness of the problem. I don't want to be cleaning up. Uh, and you know, people have said in the past, which I agree with. If all we do, you know, if we clean up, that's all we'll ever do. So the most important thing is to stop the production of plastic. That's the only answer. Stop single use unnecessary plastics um, and make uh, manufacturers and companies responsible for the after use of plastic. You know, when they've sold their products, you know, um, the return deposit scheme is something that's coming into Scotland, I think, in 2022. Um, just to make manufacturers, you know, reduce the amount of plastic. And if we can do our own bit by refusing plastic, reusing plastic, uh, refilling things, um, you know, all these help on an individual level. And if we want to do more, we can go online and sign petitions, which, you know, ultimately become effective in, um, you know, stopping certain types of plastic. Well put. Thank you so much, Mandy. And, um, I'm going to need to start rounding us up, I'm afraid, and it feels like this conversation is only just getting started, which um, which is a very good thing. Um, I, in, in listening to everybody's presentations today, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the anthropologist's uh, comment that often gets quoted, attributed to Margaret Mead, um, and that small groups of people can change the world. Um, I think it's... Uh, is probably the only thing that ever has, I think, is the extension to that quote. But um, I think it's never to underestimate how, how much individuals can make a change, um, you know, and how individual choices, um, when added up, make a big difference. So, um, so coming back to individuals and a few things to, to conclude with and, and, uh, and wrap up, we just wanted to say thank you to Verity and to the National Lottery Community Fund who have been uh, supporting this webinar and supporting Green Hive to adapt and make some changes in the recent months so that we're able to actually physically bring this webinar um, out to folks. We're extremely grateful to the support of the lottery. Um, and But also big thank you to Andy in particular and to Caroline who's um, behind the chat function and behind a lot of the, the legwork that's got us all here today. Uh, I know the original inspiration was for us all to be together in a big venue and to, ha and to have a traditional conference. Um, but uh, uh, my sincere thanks and, and deep appreciation to all the panelists for sharing um, really inspirational uh, work in a beautiful way and under challenging circumstances with technology, uh, we've just about got there in the end. So thanks to all the panelists for joining us. But we've had attendees for, from New Zealand, from Indonesia, from Canada, from America. There's people all over the globe, as well as people closer to home um, in Scotland. So thank you so much for everybody that's um, joined us. You will be able to get information on each of the panellists um, through uh, their individual websites, but we'll make sure that you can get information through Green Hive as well as the hosts and organisers of this webinar. And um, if you haven't already gone on to our site as part of this work, uh, we'll also be posting the web links there too. Uh, you'll see Andy's wonderful new clocks um, on our shop, which uh, the volunteers have um, been, you know, beautifully and lovingly creating there. So uh, do explore the links on the Green Hive site, but also all the other sites that we'll share with you. And uh, Thank you for everything you're doing to help improve our environment and to improve our oceans. And uh, thanks very much for, for joining us on the webinar.
So we've got a, um, uh, as, as that formally concludes our uh, presentation, so to speak, but um, the last thing before you go, uh, for those that are, um, that are on the webinar via Zoom, please, if you wouldn't mind just uh, answering these brief questions. Um, panelists, unfortunately, you can't vote on your own um, on your own presentation. So, um, but no, if you hopefully you learned something useful today, and if so, just uh, tick the box. Um, hopefully, we've empowered uh, or energised you to take action on marine plastics. Uh, but we'd also be uh, keen to know how you've heard of the whether you've heard of the organisations that took part today, and uh, whether you'd like to see further updates. So, if you wouldn't mind just um, uh, clicking the various feedback poll questions, that would be uh, fabulous. Can I just say a big thanks to you, Neil, as well, for um, for keeping us on schedule and on track. And, um, and a big thanks to all the guests. Really, uh, really inspiring all the work you're doing. And hopefully after, um, if lockdown keeps easing the way it is, we can um, we can maybe meet up another time and, um, and maybe work together in the future. So thanks to all of you. And thanks to everyone for, um, for joining us on the webinar as well. Um, thanks.